Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you. Welcome back to the next panel of the ACTC conference. Um, we're so excited to hear you present. Ground rules, same as last time. Each presenter will have about 15 minutes to read their paper. Um, then after each presenter has read their paper, at the end, we'll open the floor up for questions. Um, to ask a question, please use the raise your hand feature, especially if your camera's off, because obviously you can't see hand. Um, it's right down there by the little reactions. And of course, after each person does their paper, give a clap use the clap emoji, whatever you prefer, just give praise for them coming out here, presenting their work, we're going to have a great time. Um, of course, while people are presenting, if you're not talking, please put yourself on mute, though, of course, you're welcome to have your camera up like I do, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Um, let's get started. So for the lineup today, we are going to start with Abby Alley from Rhodes College with their essay, Frankenstein as an anti-racist text, how racist ide ideology is subverted by its inclusion. Give it up for Abby. All right, y'all. Contextualization and subsequent examination are essential parts of reading core texts in an academic setting. It is important to see how the political climate, religious beliefs, and prejudices surrounding a text have seeped into it. Texts are like flowers. They are deeply rooted in and affected by the soil in which they grow. In Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, contextualization meant reading an article by Jason Kelly about Mary Shelley's simultaneous anti-slavery beliefs and close proximity to proponents of contemporary racist ideologies. When I began to examine not just the invocation of those ideologies in Shelley's Frankenstein, but also how they functioned in the text, I came to the conclusion that we cannot only see those ideologies role in the text as oppressive. As I read you this paper, Derek Chauvin is on trial for the murder of George Floyd. In June 2020, amidst the crisis of the novel coronavirus outbreak, George Floyd's death sparked a conversation nationwide and worldwide about racism and police brutality. I read Frankenstein the semester after Floyd's death, which means that I read this text during a time when our society was scrutinizing everything from a racial perspective, including the term master bedroom, band names such as the Dixie Chicks and Lady Antebellum, and Uncle Ben's Rice. I felt pressured to speak out publicly about race, and that pressure meant that some of my public reactions were rushed and rooted in fear rather than true moral and intellectual growth. It was shocking to read that even Mary Shelley, who was ahead of her time on the issue of slavery, included racist ideology in Frankenstein. In light of all of these factors, it was a good exercise in critical thinking and prudence for me to take a step back from the chaos and social media activism and examine whether or not Frankenstein really is a text that propagates racism. In his article, Slavery and Race in Frankenstein, Jason Kelly proposes that Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, in spite of its progressive author, is influenced by contemporary racist ideologies that were used to justify slavery. He specifically emphasizes this racist influence with regards to the creature's physical description. While it is true that the creature is identified as non-Caucasian, the creature's non-Caucasian characterization serves as a criticism of Victor Frankenstein, the creator, more than the creature. Therefore, the contemporary racist ideology's function in the text is not simply one of oppression and the reinforcement of mythical racial inferiority. It is also one of an ugly reflection back on the creators of the institution of slavery and more generally racial oppression, through Shelley's emphasis on Frankenstein's unethical creation and subsequent lack of responsibility for his creature. According to Kelly, Mary and Percy Shelley were friends with William Lawrence, a doctor who subscribed to the racial theories of Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. Blumenbach theorized that the Caucasian race was the original race of human beings, while the Mongolian, Malayan, Ethiopian, and American races were degenerations of that race. This evidence makes it abundantly clear that Shelley was aware of the racial theories of her day. Additionally, skin color to Shelley and her contemporaries was an indicator of racial difference. Therefore, the description of the creature as having yellow skin can be read as an indication of the creature being non-Caucasian. Kelly claims that this description of the creature as being non-Caucasian and simultaneously being described as ugly by everyone in the novel serves as a reinforcement of the Caucasian-centric beauty standards of the society Shelley lived in. However, this is much too shallow a reading of Shelley's inclusion of the creature's skin color. The most obvious reason the creature is seen as ugly is not his skin color. It is that he consists of sewn together corpses. Humans naturally have an aversion to corpses and the inconsistencies of the creature's features combined with the stature surely would have caused terror in those he came into contact with more than his skin color. 
The creature's ugliness, therefore, is a result of his creator's method of creation. In order to create the creature, Frankenstein collects body parts from the dissecting room in the slaughterhouse. This indicates that Frankenstein stole the bodies of dead human beings and animals, mutilated them, and stitched them together for his own purposes. Every human being recognizes the respect owed to a human corpse, which is why burial rituals exist. Frankenstein goes directly against his human nature in undertaking this operation, and he is aware of that fact. He says himself that often did his human nature turn with loathing from his occupation of stealing corpses. When taking into consideration the creature's non-Caucasian race, Frankenstein the creator can be seen as the creators of the institution of slavery. The creators of the institution of slavery stole human beings from their homes, from themselves, and from their families, abusing them in their bodies and using them for their own gain. Similarly, Frankenstein steals human beings from their graves and from themselves in using the parts of human beings to form another creature. He uses the human body for his own purposes, just as slave traders and owners did. Just as the creature's very self is made up of the parts of many people, further complicating his identity, the cultural self of the enslaved combines with the culture of the enslavers. In Frankenstein, as well as in the institutors and perpetrators of slavery, one sees a blatant disrespect for human life and the human body that any human being can recognize. Besides the problem of the creature's racial identity in relation to his ugliness, there is the problem of his moral and intellectual capacities. According to the natural philosophy of Shelley's day, which is, side note, that, that basically just means science in our terms, and more specifically to ruins or meditations of the revolutions of empires by Comte de Volney, which the creature himself encounters in the novel, race indicated moral and intellectual inferiority or superiority. However, this is not consistent with Shelley's characterization of the creature. The creature possesses great intellectual and moral capacities. When living in the hovel, the creature learns how to understand, speak, read, and write language simply from observation. Among the first books he reads is Paradise Lost by Robert Milton, and he understands it perfectly and engages with it intelligently and morally. The creature is also humble and knows that he is ugly and not like his cottagers, but he believes in spite of his ugliness that they will see the beauty of his soul. When the creature realizes the poverty of the cottagers, he stops stealing their food. He also observes Felix's daily, task, no, daily tasks, noting that he chops wood and chops wood for the cottagers as a gift. The creature says that to be a great and virtuous man appeared the highest honor that could befall a sensitive being. Only after the, cre the creature's rejection by the cottagers does he begin doing evil. If Shelley's point in describing the creature as non-Caucasian was to assert the intellectual and moral failings of the non-Caucasian races, she failed enormously. The creature is a beautifully intelligent and moral person, but what completely morally wrecks him is the rejection of his creator and other human beings. When the creature is rejected by the cottagers and they leave, he, he desires to injure human beings in his rage. Since no humans are around, he burns down the cottage. Destruction of property and the desire to injure human beings are morally wrong. However, the creature's desire to make his creator's life a living hell like the one he lives is what causes his complete moral destruction. He wants his creator to feel the same isolation that he does, so he murders William, Justine, and Elizabeth simply because Frankenstein loves them. The creature is morally wrong for committing murder and framing Justine, but Frankenstein also bears some responsibility for not treating his creation with respect and not taking responsibility for it. As the creator, Frankenstein is just as much responsible for his creature as a parent is for their child. As the creature recognizes when he reads Paradise Lost, God created man beautiful in his image and loved his creation, while his creator finds him ugly and hates him. While Frankenstein's behavior does not give the creature a moral pass for all of his crimes, it gives an interpretive window into the issue of slavery and race in Frankenstein. If the creature is viewed as the institution of slavery and Frankenstein as its creator, Kelly's image of the creature as another race, powerful and revengeful, running amok and threatening the safety of Europeans takes on a new meaning. Just as Frankenstein bears some responsibility for the actions of the creature because of his act of creation and subsequent irresponsibility, so too do the institutors and perpetrators of slavery. If enslaved peoples revolt, threatening the safety of Europeans, it is partly due to their enslavers' creation of the institution they are revolting against. By designating the creature as having yellow skin, Mary Shelley established her contemporary readers that he was non-Caucasian. According to the racial ideology of the time, race was a measure of beauty, intelligence, and morality. 
However, in Frankenstein, the creature's race does not function as a criticism of non-Caucasian people, but rather the creators of slavery and its beneficiaries and the perpetrators of racial inequality. And I'll paste the, the citation for the article I read in the chat. Thank you all. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Abby. All righty. Next up, we have Javier Marziegos um, from the Catholic University of America with his essay, Humble Pilgrims, Humble Poets. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you, guys. And, and Abby, that was, a, that was an awesome paper. Thanks for that. Um, OK, here we go. Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, the foundational work of English poetry, is a collection of stories, translations, and fables told by a group of springtime pilgrims on their way towards the tomb of Thomas a Becket. Although the work is unfinished, the narrative frame and conflicting thematic content within the multitude of tales makes this work of poetry a sophisticated tapestry of literary and philosophical inquiry. At the same time, one of the defining characteristics of this tapestry is its complication and resistance of easy answers to deep questions about the human condition. This reflection will hopefully explore how that resistance to easy answers combined with a narrative frame that encourages one to find answers can teach students a fantastic lesson about approaches to literature and storytelling that are rooted in a certain kind of intellectual humility. This past fall, I enrolled in a course called English 351, Chaucer and his age number one, experimental storytelling from my English major. In the opening sentence of the Canterbury Tales, both springtime and pilgrimage are complicated notions. They are both at the same time heavenly, cosmically ordered, and simultaneously human, earthly, and almost base. This relationship is not easily parsed out. One of the things our wonderful professor showed us during these first weeks of class was that this complication was characteristic of the tales as a whole. Everything requires a certain double vision to understand. At the same time, those things about which Chaucer presents conflicting perspectives and explanations are not at all trivial. The image of springtime, for example, ends up developing richly into a discussion of human nature in the first four tales of the collection. It is in this context of double vision that Chaucer gives his tales their narrative unity. He frames the entire pilgrimage as having two goals. One, to find out which pilgrim can tell the best story, and two, to use the stories as a preparation for their arrival at the final destination of Canterbury. Competition and pilgrimage become the two uniting goals of all the storytellers, and Chaucer explicitly suggests that his readers keep these two purposes in mind during each of the stories. It is in this way that the poet invites the reader to search for answers about the double vision claims that will arise throughout the entire tales. Additionally, Chaucer not only presents a challenge for his readers, he also provides the standard by which to judge the tales. The poet explains that the best tale will most successfully combine moral instruction with entertainment. The famous formulation of this is sentence and solace. Sentence referring to a proper moral sense, a kind of instruction. Solace referring to pleasure, entertainment, and delight. Perhaps the most formative aspect of the tales is the fact that this challenge is tremendously difficult. As the diversity of the tales unfolds, these frames of competition and pilgrimage fall into the background, but linger throughout the rest of the work as a number of the tales are considered to fail by the standard of sentence and solace. So, the poet's challenge of judgment about things takes on its most meaningful role when one steps into the fray of the Canterbury world of conflicting complications. And it is in this stepping into this fray that the tales make, in my opinion, their most profound contribution as becoming a jungle gym for exercise of human prudence. Prudence is the virtue by which an agent makes the proper moral judgment in light of the circumstances and conditions in which they're located. It is the charioteer of moral virtues and certainly requires a certain kind of poetic double vision which sees things in the entirety of their complications. However, like the challenge of the poet, prudence requires the moral agent to make a call in a very complicated fray of things. Whatever call prudence makes, 
it will not come with an obvious black and white between the right and the wrong decision. But this is no reason to give up on prudence, but instead it is an accurate representation of the world around us. Often when compared to Dante's famous divine comedy, Boccaccio's The Cameron, the collection of Italian stories, which inspired the Canterbury Tales, is called the human comedy as opposed to the divine comedy as it complicates all sorts of notions and makes prudence labor with great toil in making judgments between stories. I think Chaucer can be considered in a very similar light. It is also a human comedy about the drama of a collective journey to a single destination. For this reason, I like to consider the Canterbury Tales as simply the human journey. For unlike the Decameron, which is fleeing from a place, the Canterbury Tales have a fixed, nearly beatific destination appropriate for a journey, but also a very complicated double visioned path towards that destination that can most aptly qualify this journey as a human one with all of the paradoxes that make up life. The first tale we read in the course put this challenge into practice. The knight's tale tells of a courtly romance of two knights competing for a love of an Athenian princess set in pagan antiquity. While the story unfolds in a traditional romantic narrative arch, at a number of points, the two knights eloquently express the difficulty they experience in, recon in reconciling the ideas of a god with the presence of suffering in the midst of the world. In short, they articulate the problem of evil. The way Chaucer describes the knights in their dilemmas creates a web of complications around the problem of evil, including the pagan setting, the poor dispositions of the knights, and the political dilemmas in Athens. At the end of the story, Theseus, the Duke of Athens in the tale, tries to give a clear cut answer to the problem of evil through a Boethian understanding of providence, arranging all things in a fair chain of love. In a typical Canterburyan fashion, this easy explanation is presented with a bit of irony, suggesting Theseus's understanding of providence is incomplete. This became one of the first moments for us as readers to ask the difficult question when the author refused to give a straightforward answer. Our professor helped us see that Chaucer was not mocking the idea of providence, but simply highlighting how providence is difficult to discern in the temporal world. Answering the question of the nature of providence is extremely important, but Chaucer is also highlighting that it is difficult. A second theme we explored through the tales was the idea that human nature is deeply corrupt and can only be expressed in a fabulous genre that mocks the aspirations of living virtues. Again, Chaucer refuses to answer this question up front. He does not give a tale that vindicates human nature perfectly, but entertains a positive and a negative view of human nature through the conflicting quites or responses of the knight, the miller, the reeve, and the cook with all of their stories. A close comparison of these tales showed us how each story layered upon the other, adding more circumstances for prudence to keep into consideration. One of the best moments in which I, as a reader, had to admit that Chaucer was changing the way I thought about stories was our engagement with, with what is known as the marriage group of the Canterbury Tales, where Chaucer explores marriage, the dynamics between the two sexes, and gender in relation to human nature. These include the Wife of Bath's Tale, the Man of Laws, the Shipman's, the Merchant's, and the Franklin's Tale. I recall going to my professor's Zoom office hours and telling her, I just don't know what Chaucer is trying to say. I feel like he's an eel that just keeps slipping away from my grasp when I want a clear philosophical answer. And she looked at me with great kindness and mentioned, well, that's the point. You have to keep trying to grasp. You cannot give up because you don't understand it right now, but there are answers and you just need to keep going through your jungle gym. As the tales progressed towards the end of the semester, the questions remained just as important and the answers just as elusive. The partner's tale, the second nun's, the, priest, the, the nun's priests, and the prioress's tale all asked profound questions about religion, piety, relationships with other beliefs, and the role of the supernatural in the natural. I found the questions fascinating, the answers complicated, but I found it very fitting. I realized I was supposed to feel exhausted and I was supposed to push beyond initial impressions and clean cut correct answers. There was a certain feeling of satisfaction, such as that after a strenuous workout. With this idea in mind, 
and in, in a renewed humility fostered by my professor, I realized that I did not need to perfectly answer every question, but I needed to wrestle with it fiercely. In class, our classmates would throw out hypotheses, ideas, and what we considered half-baked connections with no fear of being wrong because we realized that our answers needed to be formed in this kind of intellectual forge. The last theme we explored was storytelling in general. Through contrasting the tales of Sir Topas and Melaby, Chaucer highlights the absurdity of a story with pure delight and no instruction, and a story with pure instruction and no delight. One was an oversaturation of superfluous fantasy, the other was a mindlessly dry list of rules. The last tale, The Parson's Tale, is a prose guide to avoiding sin, which surely has important moral advice, but is not as attractive as the complicated web of stories which explores those exact same sins. We discovered that Chaucer's complicated jungle gym of perspectives actually becomes the proper place to exercise judgments, to refine them, even though the poet himself holds his cards close to his chest. Our professor made the point that Chaucer wanted to show through these stories that judgments in the human sphere of things almost always require this sort of fearless adventuring into questions without certainty of perfectly balanced answers. A human journey or a human comedy will rarely have the perfection of divinity entirely enshrined within it for the pilgrims haven't yet reached their destination. A pilgrim's humility rests in his status as being merely on the way. A poet's humility rests in his similar status as asking the questions the best he can, knowing that reality is full of complications but without being afraid to make and refine his judgments. This experience taught me the importance of intellectual humility. We do not know the answers and sometimes that's okay. During the coronavirus pandemic, not knowing the answers to a lot of questions felt exhausting, but Chaucer helped me treasure that exhaustion. Especially if the answer to something could wait, I learned from my semester with Chaucer that waiting was often the best road to wisdom. Waiting, observing, discussing, asking, all with an open mind were not only important during the pandemic lockdown, but also in my academic fields of philosophy and literature. If the intellectual life is a kind of pilgrimage to truth, Chaucer then taught me to be a humble traveler. Thank you. Excellent presentation, very insightful. Thank you so much. Alrighty. Finally, we have um, Matthew Shato from Mercer University um, with their essay, The Dangerous Spread of Iniquities During the Times of Crisis. Uh, thank you. And um, both really good essays. I'm a little nervous to follow them. <laughs> um, but OK. Um, whether caused by sweeping plagues or devastating wars, humanity has consistently fallen back on social institutions during times of crisis. However, whenever such calamities befall a civilization, these associations risk collapse from both the prominent external agencies and internal forces. In times of hardship, licentious and vicious actions spread as quickly as the pestilence or bloodshed, creating disastrous epiphenomenon. And consequently, fear and panic grip the masses while adroit usurpation, to use Rousseau's language, allows iniquitous people to gain power. How is this degradation of society represented in classical texts, and how is it related to the 21st century? From the beginning of Western literature, a focus on the spread of terror has taken center stage. Homer deeply explores this idea in the Odyssey through the juxtaposition of two parties. Telemachus and the suitors. Amid the Trojan War, a generation of men on Ithaca grew up with no fathers. Moreover, this great hardship imprinted upon them a warped and destructive sense of justice. The suitors proved themselves blasphemous to the gods through their blatant disregard of Zeus' rules for hospitality. However, Telemachus is proven to be the most perverted of all, depicted as gr gratuitously cruel and vengeful. As the suitors are ravaging the home of Odysseus, their king, and attempts to win the favor of his wife, Athena consoles Telemachus, his son, in saying that the wicked suitors are foolish, for they have neither sense nor virtue. 
to the point that they overlook their own impending death. In the absence of fathers, the men of Ithaca and the surrounding Greek states have become ungrateful, disrespecting their king and his family, disobeying both mortal and divine kindness. When Menelaus hired in his comrades' land, that Telemachus is, quote, being eaten out of house and home by miscreants killing great numbers of sheep and oxen on the pretense of paying their addresses to his mother. He immediately questions why these cowards would usurp a brave man's bed. These men, throwing all common sense to the wind, have rapaciously taken over their king's estate in the attempt to court his wife. Decisions lacking virtue or justice stemming from the disastrous crisis gripping the Greek world. Nevertheless, their most egregious contempt for morality came in their attempt to murder Telemachus so as to prevent him from disrupting their attempts to steal the kingdom. Uh, Antinous, described as a, quote, ringleader among the suitors, went with a crew of 20 men to lie in wait for Telemachus in the straits between Ithaca and Samos, hoping to kill him before he was old enough to seek vengeance for the sins committed against his father and family. However, after finding out about the attempt in his life, Telemachus, with his father's aid, decided to pursue vengeance, going so far as to gruesomely kill the disrespectful servants against the express orders of his father. Despite Odysseus demanding, uh, demanding Telemachus give them a clean bath, he forced the women to put their heads in nooses one after the other and die most miserably, as their feet moved convulsively for a while. After years spent in the grips of war, Telemachus has developed into a uh, sadistic murderer, more than willing to disobey the commands of his recently reunited father and cruelly kill those who dishonored him in the past. While the suitors are consistently shown to be disobedient to the laws of gods and men, Telemachus is framed as a hero, yet he still commits many of the same vices of the suitors, proving to be just as violent. Crisis begets tyrants, begging the question what kind of king Telemachus will become. Centuries later, Sophocles, sorry, Sophocles, would examine the same disastrous spread of injustice, this time with the stories of Oedipus and his daughter Antigone. Coming off the Theban civil war, Creon, the brother-in-law of Oedipus, seizes power and attempts to reestablish order. However, his obstinance and lust for power turn him into a tyrant, blindly risking the lives of his family members in order to maintain the respect he so craves. Having ruled that no one was to bury Polynices, Creon threatens that simple death will not be enough for one of his servants if he does not hurriedly tell him who broke the law, continuing by saying that he will, quote, string him up alive and wring the immortality out. Despite being king for merely a day, Creon is threatening to violently execute anyone unwilling to follow his every command, even though Antigone protested on behalf of the gods and their laws. Such hard-headedness leads him to foolishly condemn his niece to death, sealing her in a cave to await her inevitable starvation. Threatening his own son, Antigone's betrothed, when he talked back, Creon exclaimed for the guards to, quote, bring Antigone out so that she may die before his eyes. However, such dramatic and dictatorial rule over his subjects, including his own family members, leads to unintended consequences in the form of Antigone's, his sons, and his wife's suicides. After finally reversing his decision on Antigone's death, Creon arrives to discover it is too late as she has already hanged herself. In his grief, Haman, her betrothed, drove his sword into his own side, using the last of his strength to hold Antigone one last time. From the disastrous civil war came the tyranny of Creon. Furthermore, such authoritarianism bred death and, in and injustice, as out of crisis comes an opportunity for immoral or perverted powers to seize control. This corruption through power has been a constant throughout mankind, but never is the road to the throne easier than when in the middle of a crisis as shown through the suitors, Telemachus, and Creon. Despite the modern world being indescribably separated from the lives of Homer and Sophocles, the themes they explored continue to resonate today. In the age of instantaneous messaging across con continents, the spread of fake news has mirrored that of the coronavirus, bringing out malicious intentions and disastrous consequences. Nowhere is this clearer than the 2020 U.S. presidential election and the events of January 6, 2021. The storming of the Capitol shows that democracy is never safe when unchecked fear and misinformation proliferate, as seen in crisis after crisis. 
How is it that, despite millennia of advancements, humanity has failed to move beyond the words of demagogues, ready and willing to say whatever it takes to seize power? Is there hope for mankind to resist the fear and hate so rampant during times of crisis? And how has the reaction to crisis changed and developed with humanity over the last 2,000 years? And how may it be predicted to evolve from here? Yeah, I chose to, I chose to end with uh, questions rather than answers. What a perfect ending, because now we're going to jump into the section on questions. If you have a question for any of our presenters, use the little raise your hand function. I'm more than happy to facilitate discussion if necessary. We have until um, uh, 12 o'clock, I believe. Let me double, triple check that. I lied. We have until 1230. So we have plenty of time to ask any questions you might have. Um, feel free to use the raise your hand function. I have the participants listed and let's open the place for discussion. Well, to start off, I have a question for Javier's essay, if you don't mind. Um, I wanted to talk about or, or propose the idea of spatial theory, because what you write about, from my understanding, is that Chaucer does not necessarily give black and white solutions, and that's what makes his work so great. Have you considered adding the fact that the pilgrims don't actually reach the shrine destination at the end? That, that perhaps having some symbolic meaning? Yeah, um, no, I think that's super interesting. And um, it's one of the coolest things that, I mean, obviously kind of in, in my paper, I couldn't like weigh into all the, the, the different ideas I had about Chaucer, but um, yeah, the fact that it's, it's unfinished is, is really fascinating. Uh, but one of the really neat things is we have the ending of the Canterbury Tales finished, um, but we don't have the middle of it finished. So it's unfinished in that, um, Chaucer planned there actually for there to be a hundred stories, um, but there are only like, I think like 24 or 25 that we have. Um, but the ending, in other words, like the, the last chapter is written, but the last chapter doesn't end at Canterbury. It ends with um, like what's called uh, the Parson's Tale. And then the Parson's Tale goes into what's called the retraction, which is where Chaucer as the narrator takes over the tales and starts speaking from the first person and says, um, oh, I apologize everyone because I just gave you all these conflicting tales about conflicting things and I'm really sorry, but I did it all for your moral instruction. And it, there's a famous line in Middle English, right? It, I mean, in modern English is everything that is written is written for your instruction. Um, so I think the spatial theory is really interesting because like they don't reach Canterbury deliberately. Um, and I think that one of the things that I think that gestures towards is the fact that the whole work is interested not in the destination, but in the just the earthly side of things. And it would almost be inappropriate to finish with a sort of like grand, perfect uh, destination because maybe Chaucer doesn't know what that's like. He only knows what it's like to be on the pilgrimage. Um, and it, the retraction itself feels incomplete. Um, so, well, yeah, so a lot of the middle tales are missing, but a lot of scholars have, have suggested that most likely all those middle tales will be another set of conflicting ideas and perspectives and interesting webs of things. At the end of which um, is Chaucer saying, I, I really apologize for giving such a complicated thing, guys. I'm really sorry. In fact, I take it back. I take it all back, which is like super tongue in cheek because if you really wanted to take it back, we wouldn't have had it. Um, but I think that that's really interesting. I don't know if others have, have read the Canterbury Tales in other classes, but um, yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Awesome, an excellent explanation. Thank you so much. Alrighty, um, Jane McBride, you raised your hand first. Yeah, I have a question for Abby. Um, first, I just wanna say, I really love your accent. I'm sure you get that all the time and it's really annoying, but I do. Um, and my question was, and I'm gonna try to, frame this as succinctly as I can. Um, 
I feel like it's become a thing recently to try to reinterpret old texts um, in favor of our current modern understandings of social justice and um, human rights. And I think that you did so beautifully. I was very convinced by your argument. And I'm wondering, what do you think is the advantage and also possibly the dangers of doing that and of consistently trying to kind of take these old texts and try to repurpose them for our own purposes um, outside of the understandings that these people had when they wrote them, if that makes sense. So yeah, this really goes back to the idea that I talked about at first about the contextualization of what we're reading. So I think if you contextualize what you're reading and you examine the soil that like that, the flower of the text grew up in, you can get a lot of insight into how to read the text. So an example of like what you were talking about, like reading ancient texts through the lens of like modern modern eyes is one example I've seen a lot at college is reading the letters of Paul. Like <laughs> in all my classes, they're just like, Paul is sexist. And I'm like, maybe not, maybe not. Like maybe we should read some literature about it before we just start condemning people. But yeah, I definitely see that problem. I definitely, I think it's a problem, but I think at the same time, we also, this is the problem, right? Like we can't just throw everything from the past out, but at the same time, we have to critically examine. But one of the things I talked about in my paper is we have to be prudent, you know, like with the whole like social media activism, like I, I felt so pressured to like take a stand immediately and not stop and think. And I think if we take the time to sit down and read, if we take the time to read historical criticism, if we take the time to look at the translation, like the original, the original language versus like our translations that we have, I think that those are really helpful tools to really get an understanding of the text. And I think another important thing is like, just because a text is problematic doesn't mean the whole text is problematic. So maybe there are, the author has good understandings and good ideas outside of like, I guess the, the weeds that could also grow up out of that soil, you know? Thank you for that question though. That's really, that was a really good one. All righty, um, Mr. Jonathan, your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, wow, now I have all, all, all kinds of questions that I didn't start out having. So thank you for your answers, everybody. Um, uh, my question was for Javi um, about sort of following up on what you said in answering the first question. Um, I guess I'm wondering why you think the retraction happens after the Parsons intervention, which as you pointed out in your presentation differs so much from what came before. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, does, uh, I know that there are people that take that to be a kind of endorsement, and there's also people that take that to be a kind of, um, well, I don't know, put, put, pumping the brakes in response to the Parsons tale. And I'm wondering where you stand on the relationship there between the sort of very close proximity between these two things at the end of, at the, end of what, the text we have. And maybe I should say just in addition, and in particular, what that means for the kind of counsel that the parson gives, as opposed to the kinds of things that were presented with earlier in the in the tales. Yeah, um, I think. I mean, I've been thinking about this a bunch, like since the course ended, um, and I definitely don't think like I have some sort of really like keen way of like explaining why you know that proximity is there and, and and what it's doing in response to like it's coming off the heels of the parsons like it's really kind of a a manual of, of confessors of like it walks through the seven deadly sins um very systematically very scholastically really and it kind of gives advice for for those um and i think um I think one thing that's working there is, I think Chaucer is trying to like draw a distinction in how different he is and his poetic project from the sort of like scholastic di distinction approach of moral theology in, in, in a certain sense, because it's so like the, there are a number of other parts in the Canterbury Tales 
so so in other words, and I think like to put my card though, I think Chaucer is not like he's using the retraction very ironically. So what Chaucer really endorses are the actual tales that he labors over. And it's not that he like is really like disavowing the parson's advice and the parson's sort of systematic approach, but he's using it to really foil how new his approach is of like the moral imagination, sort of like the stories, the complicated prudential jungle gym. Um, which is interesting if you think about like stories, this, this jungle gym of prudence and scholasticism as the jungle gym for another kind of virtue. I don't know exactly what that is, but I bet you there's a kind of thing that we can think about there. But um, there's a number of other parts where Chaucer makes fun of theologians. And he says, you know, like when he talks about the problem of evil in the Night's Tale, he says, well, I, actually, I'm sorry, guys, I can't talk about this because I'm not a theologian, you know, and the theologian is going to talk about it, but I can't. And it's very tongue in cheek and it's very much like he does it a lot. Um, and then there's the stories of Topus and Melaby, where he also kind of makes fun of the clear cut moral instruction as well there. Um, but I think it is more of an endorsement of the tales and the fiction of the tales and the sort of craziness of the tales. Um, and it is a sort of almost a check on like the scholastic push or at least a, a, an introduction of something else or a completion of something scholasticism is lacking. Um, but uh, yeah, does, I, I, I don't know if you have follow-ups or anyone else has some follow-ups on that, but that's one of the, one of the problems. Um, Mr. Jonathan, I think your um, microphone is muted. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for that. I, I, that was precisely what I was curious about, um, where your sympathy was um, here, because I, I think there are some, some readers that take it less ironically, and it's like, oh, well, we finally get something clear and moralizing and systematic, and then um, I don't know if that's more or less ironic a reading of the retractions, actually. It depends on, it's like layers of irony, but that, thank you for that. I was very curious where you stood, so thank you. Javier, your question. Yeah, so I have a, yeah, I guess I have a question for, for Abby. I know I'm almost on the panel, but, and it's kind of uh, based off Jane's question. And I've had this conversation with a number of friends and, and I just don't know what to think. Um, so Jane talked about like, you know, reading a text with current worries and things like that. Um, and, and I want to ask like, what you thought about seeing texts as, you know, texts are inspired by ideas on the creation end of things and the presentation end of things. Um, and I wonder if that same text could also be inspired on the receiving end of things. You mentioned the letters of Paul. Um, and just because like in the case of scripture, you know, for those, for those who are Christian, there's a sort of parallel to this where like, there's this idea that the Holy Spirit inspires the writer of sacred scripture and also the reader of sacred scripture. So in other words, like, you know, maybe like there wasn't this connection that was explicitly in the mind of of Mark, but the Holy Spirit through Mark has put it there. And then through the reader, in other words, like the commentaries on scripture, you have a, a sort of new crop that comes out of the text. And I wonder if that could be said about any sort of text, especially poetry, when you're like, ooh, you know, did, did, uh, did, did Lord Byron really mean that? Or is that really what, you know, William Blake meant? well, can the reader also be inspired? And actually, in other words, see things that are really there in the text. They're not like brought it from the outside, from their own kind of like Jane's worry about like, look, I'm just thinking about like deconstruction theories or whatever, but like, but it's really in the text, but it really is inspired from someone beyond just the author. Um, and I wonder if with, even with Chaucer, the same could be said there, but I, I wonder if either you or, or Jane had some thoughts about that. So I'll, I'll just go ahead. This is also something I've wondered about because last semester I was in an English class and we studied American short stories. And my professor was very much, if the author didn't put it there, it's not there. <laughs> and that's very much not the approach that I take to things. And so I remember reading this story by Raymond Carver and it was about like a couple and there's this peacock in the story and I, whenever I see a peacock as, as a Christian, I'm like Flannery O'Connor, Flannery O'Connor. 
Flannery O'Connor and Catholicism were nowhere to be found in that story, but I somehow just made it work. So I do that. And me personally, I think like you can find things like that, but also I could see, I, I can see where my professor was coming from. You know what I mean? Like if the author didn't intend to put it there, like, is it really there? Because he was thinking more about the peacock as not a symbol of Christianity, because I was thinking of it as like family values, like children, but he, he, he used the peacock as a symbol of like a child because of how like annoying the peacock was. But anyway, but anyway, yeah, I, I really don't even know where I stand on that, but I see what you mean in that, like every time I read scripture too, like I'm inspired and I'll think of things that relate to my life. And literally every time I'll read a scripture, something new will come up and the scripture will be new to me. So yeah, I've definitely seen that from an academic standpoint. I don't know, because that kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies, but from a personal reader point of view, like, I agree. I think that there can be that inspiration on the reader's part too. Do you mind if I jump in here and no, I'm not panelists? Okay. Um, I just want to say, I think that's a beautiful idea. Like the idea that and it's not, there's no way to prove this or base it in any kind of text, but the idea that writing comes to writers from somewhere. Um, it reminds me of how sculptors will talk about um, like the negative space and like just kind of chipping away at a block to reveal something that's already there. Um, and like, they're just trying to reveal it. And as a writer myself, I don't have the religious background that the two of you have, but as a writer, that's always how I have felt in some ways. Like it sort of, fe the process feels like um, something with a capital S is feeding something with a lowercase s to me. Um, and then by that logic, there is no, writer in a way it's almost as if stories are this fluid thing and i i truly think that we should approach the storytelling process um the canterbury tales frankenstein um the odyssey whatever it may be in terms of the idea that stories are like a shared phenomenon copyright is interesting in all this too because like now we have all this stuff about oh so and so owns this story so and so owns these characters and that's just not what storytelling used to be storytelling was um a shared communal thing. So anyone could offer any take on a story and it was true because there was no true text or true story. So in some ways, I kind of think academia fails us in that sense because we're always looking at like, oh, what did the author mean? And it's like, maybe there is no author. Maybe there is only a community and that community gets to decide um, whatever that story means to them and gets to utilize it for whatever purpose. So I just think that was a really beautiful idea. Thanks for bringing that up. Yes, um, Dr. Honeycutt. Yeah, I thought all three papers were great. Um, congrats to the uh, props to the, the uh, people who gave them. I wanted to uh, just put a different question on the table uh, that had to do with uh, Matthew's paper, but is the theme of the conference in a way, which is uh, crisis. I was just curious, uh, the, the way you laid out the scene with uh, Telemachus and um, the other examples you gave, and of course, there are other ones. I mean, you can think of the plague in Thucydides or at the very beginning of the Iliad, there's a plague. I mean, I guess my question, uh, I mean, we've had something of a plague the past year. I mean, is the problem, is to is the crisis in the Odyssey, for instance, uh, like the lack of mature men on the island or is that like the result of the crisis? Like, is the plague at the beginning of the Iliad the crisis or is that just the opportunity. I mean, um, is is the plague in in Athens that Thucydides uh, recounts? Is that the crisis, or is really that just like the the tender for the crisis? So I, I was just interested in hearing your thoughts and anyone else's thoughts. Um, I mean, we've had a pandemic over the past year, but um, is that the real crisis, or is it just kind of the occasion for uh, some other? rough beast to slouch to Bethlehem, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting um, question that I don't think I'm qualified to answer. Um, you mentioned the plague at the beginning of the Iliad. Um, 
I, I considered writing about the Iliad and, and that particular scene. Um, and I wouldn't even really call that the, the crisis. That's almost an epiphenomenon or a, a secondary phenomenon from um, several other factors. I mean, you could label the real root cause of that a lack of good men in the Greek camps. You know, it's it's the uh, refusal by Agamemnon to give back Chryseis, I believe, to her father that causes Apollo to bring the plague. Um, what caused Agamemnon to do that? Well, I mean, Atreus, uh, his father killed his 12 nieces or his 12 nephews and fed them to his brother. That's the man who raised Agamemnon. So once again, I mean, it, it's everything stemmed from something. And uh, that's why I, I also considered writing about um, the Oresteia, which concerns itself with the cycle of violence and uh, how crisis begets crisis begets crisis. Um, with the Odyssey, I uh, I don't know if the war is even the first crisis that that you know is the root cause of the of the horrible men on Ithaca. But yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's a really good question. I, I don't know. It would take a lot of thinking. <laughs> Alrighty, Abby. So I have a question for Matthew. So you talked a lot about in your paper about like the idea that crises can bring like the worst, most power grabbing people to the forefront. But I also think that crises can bring beauty out of a lot of people. So like during this time, how have you seen, have you seen beauty come out of people in this time? Or have you just seen bad? I'm curious. I, uh, I don't know. Uh, I like to call myself a realist, um, but I think all of my friends would agree I'm very much a pessimist. Um, I do think that the crisis, the, the COVID-19 pandemic that we're currently in has, uh, to a degree, unified us. We, we now have a common enemy to fight. Um, but, you know, like, uh, I have friends. I'm, I'm from Georgia. I live in Georgia. Um, I have friends who posted photos with a uh, like John Ossoff, our new uh, our new senator, you know, and, and being completely apolitical, I, I did have to tell them like you are a a fool to think that any politician can love you. Like that's dark, but you that part are, right there. <laughs> you are absolutely and fundamentally kidding yourself if you think you matter more than a vote to any politician. Um, so no, I don't think I have really seen much good. I've seen a lot of death from the crisis and a lot of bickering. And then, uh, the Capitol was stormed. Um, and I know Thomas Jefferson said that occasionally the, you know, liberty needs to be watered with the blood of patriots and tyrants, but, um, he was a, a little out of taste for me, I suppose. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know how much good I've really seen in this crisis. Uh, I actually do, I have a point for um, Abby. I wouldn't necessarily call it a question, but... Um, um, all righty. Um, Matthew asks um, your question, then Dr. Honeycutt will ask his question. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, I didn't put my hand up. But um, oh, yeah, your, your point on... Uh, it's officially called, I think, presentism, where we apply present moral values to past events and, and literature in the past. Um, I mean, it reminded me um, of a couple girls in my great books class last semester when we were reading the Odyssey, who were calling Penelope, Odysseus's wife, a like a, a modern feminist figure and uh, you know a, a master class in writing strong female characters. And I think presentism can go both ways. You know, you can have people who call 
past authors and past works like Paul and stuff, sexists and racists, because they're applying modern values. And you can also have people who call Homer and Penelope feminists, you know, using more modern morality. Um, the women in the Odyssey, as I pointed out in my essay, are, are killed gruesomely. They are, if they're not goddesses, they are depicted as inferior to men and as subservient. And I said in my essays, you know, and to the class that, that you know, I, I think it would be a massive oversight to call that work a feminist masterpiece or that character a feminist. Um, I'm curious to think how you how you view the, uh, the inverse of that um, presentism. So you mean like instead of saying, oh, everything from the past is racist, saying, oh, everything from the past is actually feminist? Exactly. So like, how, okay. how you view modern feminists uh, writing about past actions as if they were not sexist. Well, I think the thing there is, like, I'm one to, to ironically be like, wow, Blank was such a feminist icon when like clearly they were not. <laughs> but I think like it's the same, the same key. Like we have to use prudence and we have to like think about it because I think you can make an argument and say that Penelope could be considered by modern feminism to uphold these blank, blank and blank values, but you would have to distinguish that that was not intended by Homer and that she just dis she displays those values or those qualities in spite of the person who wrote her or in spite of the work that she was in. So I really think it comes down to contextualization in that case. Context is so important. All righty, and Dr. Honeycutt. Yeah, I was just, uh, uh, Matt Matthews' purported realism uh, was an occasion for one of my uh, favorite kind of philosophical throwaway lines that uh, um, I tell classes sometimes that uh, people consider me a pessimist, but I'm really an optimist because uh, a pessimist says that things can't get any worse and an optimist says, oh yes, they can. Right. So that sounds to me like maybe uh, the view that Matthew's really a, an optimist in that sense, perhaps, that things can always get worse. Uh, there's always hope. Um, I, I think Abby's points are, um, are I, I thought her response to Matthew's question was a, a good one. I mean, one, one of the weird things about the Odyssey in particular, for instance, is that you don't really see, uh, I mean, I, I think it's a mistake to either pejoratively or, or in a, in a type of eulogistic way, lionizing these characters as either um, upholding or disavowing our moral presuppositions now. I mean, th there's nothing about uh, women in the Odyssey or men. There are just women or men. In other words, th there isn't some sense of that there are all sorts of portrayals of women and all sorts of portrayals of men. I mean, the way I read the Odyssey, for instance, is many of the fantastical uh, voyages, if if they in fact happen, uh, are are pretty, at least to me, clearly distortions of what a better or worse man and woman would be. Right, one of the things you see on all the on all these islands, and so. Uh, to say that Homer is a feminist or is a sexist, I think Abby's right, uh, in, in some sense misses the point that um, what we get instead is portrayals of all sorts of men and women. And then the reader slash community slash listener, uh, in the case of Homer, um, I think is supposed to reflect upon for them as Greeks, uh, what the better and worse versions are, just like we would now ask the same question in a different context. Um, arriving perhaps at different answers, but that if Homer has an intention, it would just be to motivate the question and not to push some answer um, instead of another one. I mean, I find my daughter's name is Penelope and I find Odysseus to be a very heroic figure, but I am uh, reading Virgil right now and it does not seem that uh, that is the case for Virgil. <laughs> All righty, well said, thank you so much. And um, Mr. Jonathan. Yeah, thanks. I, I, um, I've really enjoyed the, the discussion. So um, I'm so just for those who don't know me, most of you don't know me, I'm a philosophy professor at Catholic. Um, and so 
Oh goodness, turn this off. Um, and so I, I'm a very literature friendly philosophy person. Um, but I, and so I, I really love everything that's been said, but I feel the need to represent a view. So I, I'm distancing myself from what I'm about to say, but suppose, and I think that somebody who's um, modern day conservative and somebody who's a modern day progressive insofar as those categories mean anything um, could, could, could voice this kind of concern. So one, one can, in both of these, um, or the concern boils down to this, that literature is messy in a way that we don't want. We've been speaking so far in this discussion as if literature is helpful precisely because it's messy, um, but maybe somebody who's more politically progressive would say, well, why should we even bother with the messiness of interpreting Frankenstein? Why don't we just write a philosophical treatise that correctly gets slavery right and race politics right and doesn't doesn't embed it in this narrative that you have to have the right lens to to see um why risk um why risk people becoming racists in reading frankenstein if they if they bring the wrong lens why not just strip away the literature and do the clean argumentation of philosophy um, and you can see how a conservative might make that might put a similar question to Javi and say, well, why have the messiness of the stories? Why not just give a clear philosophical argument for the way to live and how we ought to live? Now, as I said, when I started my remarks, I don't I have little sympathy with these 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 kinds of arguments because I think literature is important. But I, I feel the need to push that question on on all three panelists, I think. The idea that, well, there's a risk associated with everything that's been discussed today. And I'm wondering how each of you might reply, or any one of you, I'm putting the question to everybody, but I don't want you to feel the, the need to answer. I'm just curious what you might say to somebody who says, no, just give the, give the arguments. Let's avoid the messiness of characterization and plot. So I love this question. And I think what I would say to that person is that literature is important, First of all, because it's fun. Second of all, <laughs> because human beings are messy. So literature is going to be messy. So if you're going to write real characters and tell a real story, like it has to be messy. And if you wanted to read just how to live, you should go read St. Thomas Aquinas. You shouldn't read a piece of literature. But yeah, <laughs> that's kind of our response to that. But at the same time, like, I think this has a, like, a, there's a relationship here that I'm seeing between like, I see in literature like the messiness of the characters and like the moral complications reminds me of the concept of formal versus material sins in Catholicism like something can objectively be wrong, but it depends on the individual's conscience the like it depends on the individual whether they actually committed like a mortal sin in that moment. So that's kind of like a concept i'm thinking about and in real life like morality is so there is a human aspect to morality because God made us human. You, you can't remove that, you know? And I think it's very helpful to see how morality plays out in realistic human situations because yes, reading St. Thomas Aquinas is very helpful for moral guidance, but at the same time, you see like on Catholic answers all the time, like how do I apply this moral principle to my life? Because like every single human situation is so complicated and there are so many factors and everyone is so different. But I love that question. Yeah, I think um, I would like, yeah, kind of ditto everything Abby said and then add to it. Um, I think like, yeah, that I think, yeah, one of the things exactly what Abby was saying was why I found the Canterbury Tales so intriguing because they put things in real time. And I guess just to kind of like give, give a couple of like ideas I've been thinking about. One is this idea of like a liberal arts education teaches you to do wisdom in real time right because like in real time you're always in specific circumstances that are like almost impossible to to totally like theorize so you're always doing them temporally and insofar as like you want to to live a good life um you have to be able to to do prudence like i i often think of prudence as like it's like it's like having like tools 
to be a good basketball player and like which pass to make, whether you not you should look or not, or bounce pass or this shot or that shot. Like there's a, like a thousand things you can do in a basketball game in a given situation, but you need to be able to every, every decision you make, you have to judge on like where you are on the court, who's on the court, when and where, and morality is always like it always plays out in time. And and then I would I would say that like the only way to like become good at that is by practicing doing it a lot and literature kind of gives you these extreme scenarios in which you can if you can practice over here it might be easier to practice in real life and then maybe real life does get that complicated um in which case it becomes it becomes really dramatic and i, I mean we're just um just this week one of my professors saying guys life is dramatic um and it's really neat to read like some of shakespeare's metadrama with that in mind as in like the whole world's a stage like okay what does that mean and like this is dramatic and and you know that struts his hour but anyway you know and then the, this this other thing i guess i'm really showing my cards because i'm a big shakespeare fan is this idea of like i talked a little bit about the double vision um in chaucer and like what literature i think trains you really well to do is put things together so you can have double vision um if if philosophy is the art of making distinctions Poetry is the art of putting things together. That's what kind of metaphor is at a very broad level. But also, like, I think double vision is a cool thing just to keep in mind because, like, there's like always blank and blank, like, and then and you know, in 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 the Christian tradition, there's a lot of these of like, you know, you know, like grace and nature, or whatever. It, but like those that combination of things, um, I think is really is like so human and like paradox is very human and like how how can you handle paradox without that sort of poetic double vision of like oh look on the one hand it's this on the other hand it's that and um i think that helps like relieve a lot of the tension that like you know i think jane was talking about like what do you do when like you have stories as like a living tradition right it's something that that's alive and i think one way that keeps things alive is the ability to have double vision um, on a broad scale, but then also kind of in concrete situations. Like, on the one hand, this act might benefit me, you know, but like having that ability to see the whole. Um, yeah, I actually, and it's, it's so far that I would say like the philosopher without poetic double vision might limp a little bit, might limp. And actually, even someone like Thomas, Thomas Aquinas, who has a very systematic approach, did have a bit of that poetic double vision. Maybe he just wasn't writing in it, but he certainly did. Um, so that's a, that's kind of a, a winded way of different ideas. Um, Matthew, did you want to respond to, um, is it Dr. Jonathan or Mr. Jonathan? Apologies. <laughs> your microphone apologies. it's not a big deal but yeah dr butachi all right dr butachi thank you so much um matthew did you want to respond um is your is your question related to, to yeah dr. Butachi? yeah that's uh, i was gonna right. respond and in that case you may go and then um ella may go um yeah it was a very very interesting question um and it reminded me especially when abby mentioned uh saint thomas aquinas of um the Muslim and Jewish traditions and their relation to philosophy. Um, this year in Scholastic and Humanist Philosophy, I read uh, Muslim and Jewish uh, and a Jewish thinker who disagree on the place that philosophy has in religion. Um, for, for instance, Al-Ghazali wrote uh, a book called The Incoherence of the Philosophers. Um, Tahafid al philosophia I believe, is the uh, Arabic. But in it, he essentially outlines that philosophy is caustic, is dangerous for religion, that it uh, only serves to pose questions in the mind of the follower, that when he can't answer, he turns away from faith. Uh, whereas Averroes writes a book called The Incoherence of the Incoherence, uh, To Hafet al To Hafet, where he argues vehemently for the place of philosophy in the mind of the religious man, and that it is not only important for 
a Muslim to study philosophy, but it is necessary for him to study philosophy to truly discover what Allah wants in life. Um, and then Maimonides, um, the Rambam, the most famous Torah scholar of all time, writes uh, what he calls the guide of the perplexed, um, or the guide for the perplexed. And he sets out who the book is for, which is a kind of contradictory, I, I hesitate to say contradictory because that would mean, that's a very strong word, but almost a, a you know, strange set of requirements for who should read it. And he says, I have it up. Um, yeah, he says it is for the man who has arrived at deep set beliefs in the truth of our faith and who is perfect in the religion and moral sects. Which is curious because it's the guide for the perplexed. So you have to be fully versed in moral and religious beliefs and customs, but you also have to, you, you are perplexed. You're still not understanding all of it, but you're perfectly versed in it. Um, and even though he writes this guide for the perplexed, uh, guiding him, guiding the reader through the Torah, he does still caution that philosophy in the wrong hands will lead to people asking too many questions. And that for the layman, it is much simpler and much better to give them the laws that uh, God or you know Yahweh sets out. And from there, uh, once they have understood them, then they can ask the questions. But to the layman, it would be dangerous and caustic to, to even think about introducing philosophy. So it was a really interesting point. Um, and it made me remember all of this stuff that I, I had read earlier in the semester about philosophy's place with religion and, uh, and whether one can truly just write a simple treatise outlining their exact thought process and their exact beliefs for life. So it was really interesting. I like that question a lot. Well said. All righty, Ella. So I have a question for Abby. So we've been like, you've been talking about these things about like, oh, like not maybe well, the, the balance of applying modern stuff. Oh, sorry, my Zoom screen disappeared. Um, applying modern, the balance of applying them too much and then applying them not enough, sort of that idea. So the, what I was wondering is sometimes there's a, points where the text is just racist. They knew it was racist. There's points where the text is sexist. They knew it was sexist, anti-Semitic. They knew that. So sort of the question I, question I was wondering, is there like a benefit to reading that sort of stuff? Like, is there a benefit to reading racist books that they knew? And like, can we learn from that? So um, I was thinking of C.S. Lewis has an essay in God in the Dock and then in his introduction to Athanasius, which if you haven't read, you should read that because it's a very good for good argument for reading the text we've been talking about. But um, he writes like you should read the old books because you can see what's wrong with them in the way you can't see what's wrong now. And so if almost reading that, if that can help us be insightful to those problems in our time. And the other thing I was thinking of often when I read those things that um, because I'm not a person of color, I don't quite key into why things are I will believe people that they're a big deal, but I don't know why. But then when I read these older texts, I'm like, oh, that is the origin of that. I understand why that's upsetting. But then also balance with when I read books and the author just starts railing against how like women are, you know, not very, you know, not very intelligent. They're irrational. That kind of turns me off from the book. And I don't have respect for the author because they don't have a mutual respect for me. So like where, like, that's a couple of thoughts I'm mishmashing together to see like, where do we find value in that? Or is that something we should cast off and say, no, we shouldn't even promote that at all because like we, you guys were discussing that there can be a danger in opening that up to people. I think that's a really good question. And like, right, like you said, like some books are just inherently racist, anti-Semitic, sexist, like that is true. But I think, I'm, I'm not a censorship person. So I would say uh, the wrong book in the wrong hands is very dangerous. So I think if everyone had an ac had access to like an adequate education, like maybe that could help solve that problem. But 
I'm thinking about Mein Kampf by Hitler, like that book in the wrong hands, dangerous. But also it also, it gives you a window into the way he was thinking. And if you read it, you can, if you can see inside of an argument, you can pick it apart from the inside out. And I think getting into other people's brains and seeing like the rationale of their sexist, racist, blank beliefs, I think that's very helpful for arguing against them. Cause I think you kind of have to get in their mind to ever argue against them. Because I think straw manning is something that we kind of tend to do when we discuss these texts too, is we just kind of like reduce the text because we're like, oh, blank is racist. So we're just gonna like reduce it down to like a, a like straw man and we're just gonna like punch it to death. But I think you have to take the argument on its own terms. And I think you have to punch at it that way. So yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. But yeah, the wrong book in the wrong hands is very dangerous. I agree with you. And some texts are just racist and anti-Semitic, but I think there is value to reading them. I think, yeah, that's a good answer. That's a large question. I didn't think you were going to have a specific, well, these books you can read and these books you can, you know. Um, Dr. Honeycutt, you had your hand raised at a moment. Did you have a, did you have a question? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I can... Uh... Just real quick, I mean, I think um, what Jonathan said was very interesting. Uh, I mean, I'm a philosopher too, but I also have great sympathy with literature and uh, read philosophy that way in, in many regards. And, and uh, I think there's a temptation for um, there's a temptation for certain types of philosophers and maybe literary theorists too to um, want to make things clear. And it's worth thinking about whether things are lost in, with the clarification of ambiguity. Um, and I think uh, the, in the other direction, there are types of philosophers and I, I guess literary theorists that um, try to generate obscurity intentionally. Right? And I think something is lost uh, in that pursuit also. And I think the tricky thing, and, and it's funny that great authors, whether they're philosophical or literary or whatever discipline, I think strike that balance somehow between, um, I mean, nothing's really clear in a great author, but nothing is completely opaque. Uh, and so I, I tend to work on people like Plato and Machiavelli who um, don't really make anything clear, but it's accessible. And I think that's the the great works somehow strike that balance. Um, whereas I think uh, most of the time that balance is not struck, which is why most works are not great or even very good, including perhaps my own. <laughs> but I think I think uh, um, Ella's question or Ella's point is a or a question is a sensible one too. I mean, um, I think one of the reasons to read uh, problematic things. Um, is precisely to try to figure out how it is that someone could believe these things. And sometimes uh, it's just someone's deranged or something. But I mean, I, I find it often to be the case that um, there are worldviews that make sense internally. And, the, and uh, if, you, if you read things like whatever, Mein Kampf or Heidegger or Carl Schmidt or pick your favorite bugbear, right? That uh, for some people it's Aquinas or, you know, <laughs> pick your favorite bugbear that you can try to make sense of it from the inside. Uh, to, to know your enemy like a lover, I, I think is a, an, is a admirable aim anyway. And, and it does not seem to be the one that prevails uh, in our world. But um, I think it's also, it also gives us a chance, finally, this last small point, I guess, is just to reflect upon the fact that the things that we take to be uh, like self-evidently racist or sexist uh, will be different in 20 years. And um, when all of you are teachers, uh, your students will have moral presuppositions that uh, will be very different from your own, even though uh, supposedly the, the ones today are very clear and distinct. And uh, it may be that all literature is problematic in some way, but maybe that's not a, uh, that's not a terrible thing. It's just kind of the nature of the human endeavor. Well said. Um, well, we have about 10 minutes until our session ends. So I think, Abby, you'll have the last question, if that's all right. 
Okay, this is a big question. So right, my question is for Javi. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask, you brought up like the relationship between philosophy and poets. So I was wondering, do you have any thoughts on Dante and especially his relationship with Thomas Aquinas? Um, excellent question. Um, I do, I mean, I, I love Dante. I think, um, yeah, he's, I think he's a tremendous artist. He and he, um, he often, you know, he describes Virgil as his guide. And it's cool when in, in Purgatorio and Virgil departs from Dante, Dante feels kind of sad. He's like, man, like there went my mentor, you know? And I think that like, just to answer your question up front, I think of Dante the way Dante thinks of Virgil. Um, but one of the best things I heard about Dante and Thomas Aquinas was that um, Thomas Aquinas did a lot of head work. He did a ton of head work. He was just thinking really strongly. And Dante was the genius who turned that head work into heart work. Um, and I just think that's a great way of encapsulating, I think, the relationship. And that's that, like, the, uh, the sort of thing that, that they're tapping into, the sort of way they see the world. It, it really is a way they see the world. They see it as a world that's characterized by the love that moves the sun and the stars, which is how all three of the, right? Anyway, that, that's how the comedy ends. Um, but that the poet's job is to also give that vision um, in a way that's that's particularly beautiful. Not that like Tom Aquinas's writings aren't beautiful, but like it's a, it's attractive. It's a song. It's it sounds beautiful. It's beautiful to like our human like. It's beautiful in the way that like like a mimosa is beautiful, and that like it's just so delightful. Like the comedy is is delightful, and ideally, right, you would listen to it or read it just just for fun and it's shaping your heart and your moral imagination. And oftentimes, I don't know what to think about, you know, this recent trend in like left brain, right brain people, you know, like left brain is like really analytical, right brain is kind of big picture. But I think if, if it does gesture to anything, and it's, it's that like, there's this, there's this, what I like, I've called, I've talked about the poetic double vision. It's like the poet sees things in holes. The poet sees things as like the right brain. Um, and I think Dante is like a guy who's putting a whole worldview into song. Um, and I think that like, if you would like to know, like if you've ever wondered like, what does a Christian think? Like, why would a Christian be a Christian? I, I mean, like, obviously you have like the gospel, but Dante is a great place to turn to in that like, why, why would some people find this so? But anyway, I think, yeah, he's making the head work into the heart work. Um, he has a letter to Con Grande, right, where he talks about this, like, double, the ability to, because you see things in double, therefore speak in double. Um, and poetry kind of does that. It, it's gesturing to a thing beyond itself, but also itself is very beautiful. Um, and and he was just, he was just a master. He's, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, old texts and, and Dante, like, is taking in the old texts and sort of filtering them in and out and, and working with them and wrestling with them. And I also think that Dante has a sense of poetic humility too. Like while he's doing, turning Aquinas into heart work, he's also not, he's also kind of just, he's telling you a story like a friend. He doesn't shove it down your throat. He's, he's explaining it to you. Um, I know that the, the probably wasn't very coherent, but those were sort of like, that random Dante box, at least for there. I know, I know Dr. Butachi is also a big fan of Dante, so I don't know if he had some thoughts, but uh, great question. Hello, I'm gonna pop in. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know, this has been absolutely wonderful, but if you would like to continue the conversation, if you uh, are on the socio, uh, page that kind of where you got here from the in the first place if you go down there's a little tab called mingle um, it's the the best approximation we have of getting to talk outside of our coffee it obviously is not the same thing and it's significantly more awkward but we all know each other now so that's fine um, you can pop in there you move your little avatar to the table you want to sit at and if there's two people there it'll start a chat so go figure that out if you haven't already 
Um, I just wanted to pop in and give you that option since we're nearing the end of our time. So if you have any questions for that, I'll stick around for a moment. You can just send them to me in the chat. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Miss Natalie or Professor Natalie. Apologies, um, names, brain. Anyways, thank you all so much for coming. This has been such a wonderful discussion. Um, I'd rather let people go earlier rather than later. If you're on the East Coast, get some lunch. If you're on the West Coast, get some breakfast. If you're in the middle, get a snack. Um, rest, enjoy. Our next panel is at, I believe, 1.15 p.m. Um, I look forward to seeing you all there. We're gonna have some great essays lined up. Thank you so much to all our presenters. Your essays were impeccable. Thank you so much for all the questions that you all asked. I absolutely enjoyed this discussion. I feel like I've learned so much. I hope you all have a wonderful day. I think I've frozen. Oh no, I haven't frozen. Yay. Okay, good. <laughs> no worries. Everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Goodbye. <laughs>